let's see what the latest report is for this game. Speaking of Star Citizen, I mean, that game, the video did like almost a million views already. That's madness. And it started as one of the worst performing videos of the last, like of the year. That Star Citizen video started horribly. As the first quarter of 2023 comes to a close, we're hitting a few milestones here for what we call internally the evergreen content team. That's the folks that are dedicated to the creation of weekly, recurring, some might say evergreen video content. For Inside Star Citizen, today's show represents the completion of our fourth year and 150th episode since that first evolution from Around the Verse in 2019. And when you factor in the legacy of ATV and Wingman's Hangar before that, we're now just passing the 450th episode of this continuing behind the scenes series unlike anything you'll find from any game developer anywhere else. And yet, somehow, still we never show anything good. Dramatic. It also marks the personal completion for me of eight years shepherding over 1,200 videos showcasing the creation of this project. For a second, I thought that this was just a flex because I was like, oh, it looks kind of like that Apple Mac Pro, also known as the dumpster. Apple Mac Pro dumpster. <laughs> this thing. You remember this thing? It was like weirdly shiny. This one now looks like a cheese grater, but this thing looked like a trash can. It, tell me it doesn't look like that. That looks like the exact same thing. <laughs> it's identical. Even even that one holiday live stream we don't like to talk about anymore. I don't I don't know what that's referencing, but so to sign us off for this quarter before we go about our regularly scheduled hiatus. We're bringing back an old favorite, that grab bag of tiny looks at various aspects from all over development, the Sprint Report. Hey. Now, for yeah. those of you who maybe have never seen one of these before, a sprint is what we call the internal two-week cadence where developers go off on a task, come back to check in, see everyone's progress, get some notes, and then either move on to something else or go back for another two-week sprint on the same feature. So. What that means is what you're going to see here this week is actually internal developer <clears throat> art, the kind they don't usually make to be seen publicly. It's not the flashy and somewhat mentally unstable work of the ISC gameplay capture team, who have been on quite a streak recently, possibly because we changed their medications. So without further ado, let's jump into the Inside Star Citizen Quarter 1 2023 Sprint Report and Clam Bake Showdown. I'm assuming that editorial will put a nice, subtle title on screen right here. Also, there's no Clam Bake Showdown. I don't know why I said that. Let's start things off with some spacecraft and vehicles, where there was recently a small onboarding task for a new hire to update the remote turrets for the 600i from Origin, which you can see here. I think we can all agree it's a noticeable improvement over what's in the game today. And if you watched last week's ISC on the upcoming changes to tractor beams and Alpha 319 and beyond, you might have noticed the Argo SRV flying around in that Beyond section. Here's a closer look at its progress as it currently makes its way through final art towards a scheduled release later this year. That's pretty cool. I love seeing this behind the scenes stuff. I love this. Now, for those who follow the progress tracker on the public roadmap, here are your first looks at three vehicles currently making their journeys throughout the pipeline, starting with the RSI Lynx Rover, companion sojourner to the famous Urza we all know and love, and often found packaged with the luxurious Constellation Phoenix. It's currently in gray box phase, and it's nice to see the RSI styling continue to evolve, S especially with those tires. I mean, I'm not usually a tires are cool dude, but those are cool tires, right? And as we move inside, we can take a look at the cockpit coming along. And then there's the rear, which is at the back, and which is already <laughs> far more fancy than its Ursa brethren. Okay, I thought the tires were cool, but can a chair <clears throat> also be cool? Because that looks like a comfy-ass chair. Can I, can I say that? No, no, I just edited it out. Yeah, yeah, we're fine. Good job. There's also the Crusader Spirit, which just entered Greybox phase recently. You can see here early work on the exterior, making certain every part of it matches the metrics laid out in the white box phase before it, then popping in through the rear of the ship, which like the Lynx is also in the back, and then into the cockpit that's looking, well, a bit contrasty at the moment, but that's not uncommon for gray box phase, as this period is mostly about defining shape language and material breakup before everything gets refined later in final art phase. And then let's take a look at the gray box bomb bay for the bomber variant that's being worked on in tandem with all the others. Finally, let's look at recent gray box progress on the Apoa Santok Yai, the alien Xion fighter where you can see the exterior coming along pretty well. 
Oh, I'm sorry, Rari. Yeah, I totally missed it. The audio alerts are like not working super consistently. It's really weird. <clears throat> uh, but thank you. I feel 24 will be the start of next gen gaming. <laughs> Current gen gaming uh, is what it should be. But <laughs> I, I I agree. I mean, we're we're in a weird spot right now where we're just getting all the games that were delayed heavily out of COVID. And now it's like, okay, now we're finally starting to see games that really come along specifically meant for current hardware. <clears throat> so we'll see. I'm mainly interested in like what studios like Ninja Theory and Naughty Dog do. Um, I want to see them push the boundary. The thrusters are being modeled out. And they've started exploring how the landing gear will work experimenting with the shape language a bit to make certain they're beefy enough to believably hold the mass of this entire ship when all is said and done. And as for when you're going to see the cool. 600i turret, the Lynx, the SRV, the Spirit, the Santaki I, and more make their way into the persistent universe, I'd recommend as always keeping an eye on the public roadmap for details when they become available. Now let's move from ships that fly to winged creatures, as astute readers of the monthly report might already be aware, one of the many things the AI team is currently working on is pushing Boyd's development in the persistent universe. Now, voids are the algorithmic behavior of small creatures that can populate the planets and moons of the persistent universe, with a test here of condors slowly learning to, uh, to avoid flying into mountains or drowning in the oceans beneath them. Dun, 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 dun. I do have to say, it must be very difficult to program AI, not just in a game like this, but also like, you know, um, uh, No Man's Sky, all those games, where you have a dynamically generated world and then you have to teach and have a set of rules for the AI controlled animals and wildlife and stuff to make them explore it realistically. Like it's gotta be pretty damn tough. Nobody, huh? Just me. And then some work on ocean fish. Here, completely, totally, and utterly unanimated. It's just a it's just a test of behaviors here, people. Without all the motion parameters that'll make them look good one day. Now, I'm including this as a test. If I see all you out there on the internet, it's like, these stars, there's some fish, look great. I'm going to know you don't listen to a word I'm saying. And my feelings will be hurt. Meanwhile, the Interactables team, formerly known as the Props team, have been running through and physicalizing a bunch of assets for the persistent universe, like these weights for gems like the ones you might find in New Babbage. Similar to the fish we just watched, this is also before animation has had their chance to contribute. So let's not judge the throwing form being displayed here. Still, it's nice to see even the littlest things in the verse behave naturally with realistic mass and physics whenever possible. That is cool. This yeah, it's effort harder to, to throw make things behave weight. as you'd expect them to also extends to the coffee machines of the verse, with a pass recently done to go through and repair their broken functionality. Now, I did consider turning this section into an update on either bartender or mess hall features, just for old time's sake. But someone who will go unnamed stopped me. Just know that there are heroes out there looking out for each and every one of you. Also, it looks like the team developed a few new coffee mugs along the way. We'll just let this video play for a bit. See a couple coffee cups in action and think about how much bartender stuff I'm not talking about right now. That's also, fun. speaking of bartenders, <laughs> if you want some interactables of your own, there's this new set of Star Citizen pine glasses up for pre-order on the, on, the, on, the, on, the, on the web store. I, I asked if they wanted me to promote them and they said no, because you'll probably do something silly and stupid with it. And I said, leave it with me. And they said, what? No, we said no. And I said, no problem. <laughs> and here we are. Back to the Interactables team. <laughs> They've also been pro- Such a dad. It's just dad jokes all the way, man. <laughs> ...typing a new way to hang a variety of posters on the walls of the player habs and spacecraft with these new expanding electronic devices that could let you decorate any space that's marked up for them. The prototyping here is using common adverts for in-universe events, but the possibilities of this feature become apparent very quickly in allowing players to not only decorate their spaces, but to collect and memorialize important moments from their time in the persistent universe, to take missions to set up flyers for in-game shops or events, post bulletins for bounty missions, and much, much more. And this last bit is from both the Interactables and Mission Feature team who have been developing the next dangerous new contraband to sweep its way through the persistent universe, grasping weevil eggs. Grasping weevil eggs. Is this? Is, is this, this what, what's the file name? Oh, no, well, that's what it is. Huh. Let's switch on over to the environment, planetary, and lighting team's work with these images of updated atmosphere progress for the planet Hurston, which adds a stronger layer of pollution much closer to the planet's surface that helps suck light out of the atmosphere, 
and a mm. richer gradient, and really just makes the place seem dirtier overall, which we can expect to play very well with the upcoming Loreville 2.0 and Alpha 319, some of which you can see here. I'm just going to let these images speak for themselves a bit. Yeah, that's cool. Um, if the game is too ambitious, developers should use open hub worlds with more content, in my opinion. <clears throat> the only game or the only open world games I have so far are DBZ, Kakarot, and um, Spider-Man and Arkham. All my other single player games have open hub worlds. I mean, it sort of works like that. I mean, it's all, all players are connected and then, well, all players on servers are connected. Does Star Citizen have a lot of players? I feel like you need NASA equipment to run that. Um, yeah, I mean, there's there's hundreds of thousands of players. Um, yeah, Luke has definitely drunk the Kool Aid on Star Citizen. My stance is that it freaking sucks. That it's basically pay to have fun for like some of the really cool stuff, where it feels like you need to either know somebody who has paid a grand for a bunch of ships or you need to like i guess grind and grind 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 for hours and hours and days and days and months and months uh which i mean there is stuff to do but you'll start with a starter very simple ship um and you can work your way up but it does blow that like oh you want to have really a really good time with some of these cool ships you can either spend 300 bucks or you can grind for three months and then get it. Some people don't mind the grind. I find it annoying. Um, cause I feel like I, I, I don't know. It feels like the, the curve for acquiring wealth is so heavily impacted by what ships you have. Like if you want to, <clears throat> like if you want to be a cargo transporter or something, you have to have a ship large enough to transport a lot of cargo. But if you are starting from scratch, you won't have that ship. So you won't be able to transport much cargo, meaning it'll take you really long to get enough cargo transported to be able to afford the big ship that can transport more cargo. So it feels like it's just built up in a way where it's really hard to get started. And uh, part of that is that they show you this really cool stuff <clears throat> and you'll get really sold on the idea of it. And then you'll go in there and you'll be like, well, I mean, what's a hundred bucks for a ship? What's 200 bucks? If I'm going to play this game a lot, that's really, that's not that big of a deal. And then before you know it, you've spent a few hundred bucks on a game that's still in progress and sometimes just is totally broken. And that's a little silly. So my stance is still generally, you shouldn't bother with something like Star Citizen unless you really know what you're getting into, which is why I try to be very, very transparent. <clears throat> from hiatus in just a few weeks and while the atmosphere of hurston is getting a little love so too are the verdant forests of microtech as part of a greater overall overhaul we'll be discussing more of in the coming months the forests of microtech are receiving a performative refresh that will make the environment seem richer and denser visually while providing more gameplay opportunities for cover during missions racing and other activities galore the Landing Zone teams have also completed a sprint, adding additional mission locations scattered around the Planet Crusader in the style of resort hotels that can utilize overlays for pleasant, in-use active businesses, as well as those taken over by the ever-present and vile Ninetales. Each new cluster is designed to be a procedural home for a variety of mission types, and looks to draw players out from Orison and into the far corners of the Gas Giant. And down on the surface of Hurston, work is underway on early white box phase of local law enforcement offices, a place for players to utilize the next evolution of bounty hunting gameplay we'll discuss more about later this year, to collect, or in this case, drop off the captured bodies of criminal outlaws collected by players. Now the drop off here is right up front, cause in early tests, it was getting kinda weird just walking through the hallways, pushing bodies deeper and deeper into the facility. Unless you're into that sort of thing. Moist noodle. It's kinda fun. You can then also check out the bounty boards to collect new missions here. The bounties are fun. If the game was close to being done and better optimized, I would go all in, go all in because it looks cool, but I just know I can't stand the bugs and performance issues. Yeah, well, and it's um, it, it's regularly broken. I mean, it regularly gets torn apart, and you just won't be able to... 
log in, you won't be able to play, you won't be able to get your ships, and it's super, super stupid. I mean, it's saying something that there is a system built into the game, uh, or the website for the company that's making the game, where you can clear the progress of your, your character and start over because they're used to people's accounts being broken for various reasons. And so they built a system where you can just wipe it and start over. And, um, but again, it's early access, but it's like I said in my recent video on it, there, the reason people are willing to spend 600 bucks on a ship in this game is because for some people, star citizen is their hobby. Like gaming isn't their hobby. Space games aren't their hobby. Star Citizen is their hobby. And so all the stuff you've spent, um, maybe you really like paintball. Maybe you like going and playing football. Maybe you like going and you follow sports really closely. So you buy the jerseys and you go to see a couple of season events. You go to a, a football game or something. Um, all of that money you've spent on those hobbies. Imagine all of that funneled into Star Citizen. And then you kind of understand why some people would spend like 600 bucks on it. Yeah, a lot of these players take Star Citizen very seriously. Yeah, so it's all kind of a matter of pers perspective. But from the outside, like if you look at Star Citizen as a video game, it seems insane that somebody would spend thousands of dollars on this thing that's not even done. It sounds like clearly a scam, right? Because any other video game, that would be a scam. But when you flip the perspective and you reframe it as, well, no, this is how some people like this is their, this is their, uh, their hobby. This is what they do. He took my thing.